Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Easter, if it's thing for you. I'm here with literally the rock star, the legend, Mert. How are you, buddy? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no. Always, always a pleasure. I mean, like, the honor is literally all mine. Uh, for those of you, you all know who Mert is, but if in the unlikely event nobody, somebody doesn't, his link is below. He is not only the most based, the most knowledgeable, but probably the funniest uh, follow on Twitter in the cryptoverse, in my opinion. And I could be wrong. So we have a, a lot of things to discuss. It's going to be a fun ride. We'll, you know, I've got uh, kind of a, a lot of things that are on people's minds. But the real trigger for this was a video made by somebody. Let me just pop up a couple of talking points as well. Because I do have some structure. So let me see if this works. Yeah, you and I should both be there. And by the way, this is one of the funny <laughs> tweets that uh, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of your tweets pop up here. Um, you're assembling a team. We'll get to that later. This is called FUD Fighters. You know, I think, Mert, you are a guy who is very open, direct, honest, no fluff, no BS. You tell it like it is. And sometimes people don't like that. But uh, before we get into the real story, I do want to talk about this fun fact, and that is uh, 288 days ago, Solana was at 14 bucks, and it's mm. gone up a 1,228% surge. How do you explain that? Is it all of a sudden the world is realizing, whoa, this Solana thing is really a thing, or it's just random? I know you probably don't even look at the price action, you don't care, or maybe you do, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, first, thanks for the intro. Uh, definitely can't live up to that. But I thought it was, I mean, it, it went as low as $8 at some point. Yeah. Um, and I bought an unhealthy amount at that, at those ranges. And, you know, when, when things like that happen, people let maybe their emotions get the best of them. They're like, oh, this thing is going to collapse. But, you know, if you actually were looking at maybe the, the technical side of things or the product ecosystem developers, right, the actual signals in, in, in that kind of noisy field, you would have noticed that actually that stuff has just gotten stronger. So now what you need to do is you need to have some conviction and wait uh, and, 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 and help correct the information asymmetry that exists, which is kind of why I started posting more on Twitter, because I just saw that people were saying things that just were not true, right? Things like, oh, well, Solana was only a thing because of SBF. It's like, okay, if that was true, then why is it up, you know, almost 2000% since you went to jail? Right. Like clearly there's something off about your narrative there. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I think Warren Buffett has that saying or or was it Ben Graham or something about, you know, in the short term, uh, uh, the market is like a popularity contest. But long term, it's actually like a waiting machine. Yes. So, like, I think if you have conviction for some thesis, that's not like confined to a week and maybe it's like a few years long, at least, then I think you're generally fine. And it's so funny because you mentioned you bought an unhealthy amount at $8. I have the receipts to prove I bought an unhealthy amount at $8. I could more than doubled my position. I, that was like the day looking behind the couch for coins <laughs> to try to get in there hard. But I, I do remember as well, it was very, one of the things that makes us better as kind of investors and more experienced people is I remember looking at Amazon way back when and looking at the fundamentals. And I all I do is look at fundamentals of chains and everything else. But I remember looking at Amazon, it went from 106 down to six. But the fundamentals are getting stronger every single quarter. But the market was missing that. And the exact same thing happened with Solana too. The fundamentals were getting stronger every week, every month. Chain wasn't missing a beat. Of course, the odd beat was missed back then. But the real story that I want to touch on today, because it was triggered by my community, they're saying, oh, have you seen this video made by this guy called Coin Bureau? And I'm like, no, I, in full disclosure, I don't watch crypto videos. But it was, it was kind of like a very polite, stealthy hit piece when I went through it. You know, I said, well, it's probably going to $300, but... They have continued outage issues. They're only alive because of the meme coin craze. There's nonstop congestion. There's technical challenges. The 
orders are being missed, etc. Then regulatory challenges, the SEC is going to hammer them, yada, yada. And then he talked about sustainability concerns, which is Solana's daily issuance of staking reward is significant. And that's going to hold the chain back. And then he said Solana's success is completely dependent on favorable crypto regulations. And I was like, <laughs> how does, first of all, no, all of this can be debunked in a heartbeat. Second of all, what the hell? Like, I mean, if dependence is upon crypto regulations and they're a crypto channel, that impacts every crypto under the sun. So it was clearly a hit piece, but I'd like you to like one or two sentences for each one of these points and hear from your words why you would debunk them. Sure, gladly. Uh, well, so let's start with the first one. Continued outage issues. Well, so that certainly used to be a problem uh, in late 2021. Definitely was an issue, maybe early 2022 as well. But since um, I guess it was October 2022, it's it, it had been almost a year since the last uh, reliability incident. Yep. Right. And the latest one actually had nothing to do with like chain properties. It was actually like a deployment issue. Yep. We actually already knew that there was a bug that could cause an outage. And we already had a fix out for it in DevNet. We just didn't roll out the mainnet in time. Um, so that's like a human problem, which can be fixed. It's It wasn't, um, it was a very different set of errors than the ones that used to cause outages before. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you want to talk about outages, I think the reality here is all blockchains kind of suck currently. Okay. I think Solana has shown a lot of reliability in the past year. And uh, it's actually one of the most stable ones that I'm aware of currently. Right. Because you have to also remember, like, people will say something like, well, you know, my chain doesn't have reliability issues. It's like, okay, that's because your chain doesn't have usage. Yes. Right. If, if you're not using the chain, obviously it's not going to have <laughs> reliability issues. Okay. Um, if you look at the L2s that are being used, every single one of them has went down so far. All of them. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, base fees currently, uh, they started at 0 0.01 and now they're upwards of 10 sometimes, $10. Okay. Uh, blockchains are hard. So it's kind of silly to dunk on ecosystems for, you know, outage or whatnot. We're all super early. I mean, even Ethereum itself, the uh, two days ago or yesterday now, had blobs. Uh, inscriptions on their new blob space, which is went live with 4844, and they started missing slots, right? Like the performance yeah. of the network was severely affected. So that is to say, all chains have their issues, but I think Solana has actually shown a uh, pretty good track record in the past year, uh, probably among the top. Okay. Two, meme coin craze, all it has is memes. Well, I mean, I think what he means to say here is all it has is users, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. memes, it's just a blockchain, right? It's, it's a distributed set of computers. And if people want to launch their coins, they probably want the best possible user experience that they want for that, right? Cheap fees, fast speeds, uh, uh, composability, good ecosystem of apps, et cetera, good community. That's why they use Solana, right? It's just people can use it for whatever they want. The market does what it wants, right? And if you're there to service the market need, that's all your job as a, as a blockchain. Okay, and, and I actually uh, and, remember but, but, you. I remember you distinctly saying that these memes are good at this stage of the bull run because it stress tests the infrastructure. Correct? Exactly. Right. Um, the reason why there aren't the same kind of outages as 2021 and 2022 currently is because if you remember, NFTs were running wild in 2021, and that stress tested the network and uh, exposed new flaws that were now fixed. Right. So these coins actually really help. And they have a few other effects that are really interesting. One actually ties into the sustainability concerns, right? They generate revenue for the validators, right? The traders are trading, they're playing their games, but the validators are making money off this. The DeFi, the DeFi teams are getting their integrations. RPC teams are getting their integrations. So it's, 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 a, it's a good example of composability. But also, it's not the only thing that's happening on the chain. That's just not true. Right. Like there's all of Deepin is on Solana, right? Helium, HiMapper, Render, these AI coins, Ionet, et cetera, Teleport. Um, most good payments apps, right? Like Visa obviously is made to Solana. PayPal is now doing the same. Um, Code, uh, Helio, Sphere, all these kind of X Stripe, X Venmo founders are now building on Solana. 
Um, Jupiter and Orca and Radium are consistently in the top five of all DEXs in crypto, yep. right? Magic Eden, Tensor among the top NFT marketplaces in all of crypto. Phantom, right? Backpack, Soulflare. These are all like Solana has some of the most talented teams in crypto, always within the top five or three. And so saying it only has memes is just like, just look at the data. That's just not true. Yep. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, let's see. Next one. Congestion and technical challenges. Okay. So this is actually a valid point. Um, there's certainly congestion and technical challenges. Um, but that's up, the problem you, know, you get was, with one and a half million people hitting it every day. And I know you'll argue yes. about users and stuff, but it is a, the busiest chain by far, assuming. Yeah. That. Yeah. So like, you know, uh, people will going back to my example of like, well, my chain doesn't have congestion issues or like technical challenges. It's like, okay, if you look at all the chains today, um, you have like maybe optimism doing, which is an L2 on Ethereum doing five TPS. You have base, which is the most popular one doing about 10 to 15 TPS. Yeah. Okay. Solana is doing about 2000. Okay. That is just fundamentally a different set of scale. Like that is just not even the same thing. Um, and obviously to get to that scale, you need to take some risks and you need to do things that haven't been done before. Right. I'm not going to get too technical here, but Solana has taken a lot of different technical trade-offs, for example, continuous block building um, and much uh, shorter block times, et cetera, to scale as much as it has been able to scale. But since we're kind of on uncharted territory, we're seeing new bugs come up that you can only really see at very, very high scales. Right. You might not notice that your tires aren't great until you're driving at 200 kilometers an hour or whatever the USA equivalent is. 120. Right. Yep. So that, yeah, so that's that's kind of what's happening here. But the, the the thing to note is we're all aware of this and we're fixing this every single day, right? Yeah. Um, this fact, is, this is kind on, of the... Yeah, on, on that note, sorry, uh, Tolly tweeted something about it a week or so ago or 10 days ago. We need to double, triple the block space ASAP. It was like a call out to validators or developers. Is that worth touching on at all? I may have got the details a little bit wrong. Yeah, he did. Uh, he was considering that. And by the way, anybody can kind of make proposals like this, not just totally. Um, I'm not going to get too technical, but basically there's a bug that lets people spam the block leaders. And when that happens, what happens is the block leader gets overwhelmed such that it doesn't accept transactions as much as it should be. And so, like, for example, if you pay a higher fee, your transaction might not get included because the block leader is just overwhelmed. And so there's a few networking protocol level uh, problems ha right now, but they're being fixed. In fact, Fire Dancer has a fix for all of them already, but obviously Fire Dancer is not live. Um, and so there are a bunch of fixes and patches that we're rolling out over the next coming weeks that should help solve this problem largely. But again, this is actually a really good, uh, probably my favorite part about meme points, which is that now we get to understand what happens to these systems with real world usage at very high scales. Right. I'm totally fine doing this with dog coins because in two years, when it's actually like showtime with like real assets that matter, we'll be better prepared than anybody else to handle these kinds of issues. Right. It's just learning. That's how engineering works. Cool. Um, okay. Number Thank four, you. regulatory challenges. Yeah. That applies to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one's a kind of a weird one to single out a single chain for. Um, I mean, if you read the SEC's papers, they list quite a few coins here, Solana just being one of them. This is not a Solana versus others problem. This is a crypto versus the SEC problem, right? Yep. Um, I mean, the SEC is now going after Ethereum's ETF, for example, right? We should be quite united against that as a entire ecosystem of, of people who are interested in the space. It's not a single, like if they come after Solana one day, they come after another chain the other day. That's not what we need to do here is, is be united. So like, I don't quite understand why Solana and, and by the way, like, um, reg in terms of regulatory challenges, um, the SEC has applied this argument to like ripple and they've lost. Uh, right? yeah. And, and if, so if Solana ripple is, is not a security, then I don't know what is yeah. <laughs> like, so just because the SEC says something does not mean it's actually, it holds much weight. It's kind of just annoying. Okay. Um, sustainability concerns. Okay. So this is something that people just are really uninformed about. 
Um, and I, I made a tweet about this, uh, I believe maybe a week or two ago. And it's th the way Solana uh, revenue works is actually the exact same as Ethereum. Okay. Um, people pay fees. Some of those fees go to the validator. Some of them get burned, although that's going to change soon. And uh, if you look at the kind of historical trends, um, Ethereum used to make about 40x, maybe 50x more revenue than Solana on any given day. But now that number is actually reduced to about 2.9x or yep. 3x. It's really, really getting right. And the reason is because uh, people are paying to use a chain, right? Like meme coins. Um, Solana is generating more revenue right now than um, certainly any L2, but also pretty much all L1s except for Ethereum. But the important part of that is it's doing it while handling about 2000 TPS. Right. Ethereum gets clogged up at that value at about 12 CPS. And since it's single threaded, uh, a fee spike at like, for example, market A also affects people in market B. But on Solana, that's not the case. Right. On Solana, not everybody gets a low fee, but there's so many of those low fees that they add up to something big. And obviously the people who benefit from those fees are validators. Uh, if, if you actually look at the Solana's inflation chart, it's actually trending down. Right. Um, and that's because the thesis is that, um, people will make more money as more usage, uh, happens on chain. It's the same as like any other, I, I think you talk about Tesla a lot, right? So like Tesla is a good example here, right? First you lease a roadster, right? The roadster's expensive. Not many people can afford it. Okay. Whatever. But once there's demand, you want to release kind of inaccessible, like a model three, um, and sure you have slightly lower unit margins on those. But if you sell a lot of them, right, all the uh, sustained usage and, and, and purchases uh, add up to bigger revenue numbers, right? It's just, that's just business 101. Uh, and so this is, I really don't really understand this concern. Um, and, and by the way, the issuance of, of inflation only affects you if you're not staking. If you are staking, like this does not affect you at all. Exactly. Yep. So, yeah. Perfect. And then the last one, right. success, medium to long term may heavily depend on favorable. I mean, it's, it's similar to point number four. No difference. So, yeah, I mean, that's just, I don't even, like, <laughs> everything so, depends on regulation. <laughs> so, so we'll move on. We'll move on from that. So that's the first piece of FUD stuff. Now, obviously, if you look at all the data, there's two players out there. There is Ethereum. And there's Solana. The question is, last time you were on four months ago, we spoke about the consensus trade, and it was pretty clear. Um, but there's a lot of very unique stuff happening with Solana. This came out from you yesterday, L2 nodes. Uh, I tried to dig into it a little bit and figure out what it was. But, uh, you know, your team, your company, which is Helios Labs, everybody, uh, links are below, introducing pr automatic private nodes and Solana will never be the same again. Can you tell the audience what that is about? If I'm afraid if I try, I'm going to butcher it. I have an idea, but sure. it means you can control much more of your activity on chain, correct? Sure, yeah. Like the, the way I would describe this is um, obviously a lot of people need RPC nodes to uh, interact with the chain, right? So for example, um, uh, let's say I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm trying to snipe like a meme point launch or something. I want my private node so that I can land a transaction faster uh, or, or without being exposed to other people's traffic. And so before we, people would ask us like, hey, can I buy a node off you, et cetera. Now we just made the whole process seamless and self-serve. So if you want an RPC node um, or like a geyser node, which is a way of streaming data on Solana, you would just go to Helios and then you would just click new node. Uh, you would pick the location in the world that you want. You know, maybe you want it in Frankfurt, maybe you want it in uh, Amsterdam. Maybe you want in New York. Um, and most people like generally use this to snipe these meme coins. And what that means is they basically wait for these new um, tokens to be created. And then once they are created, they try to like um, buy or sell or, or just snipe the liquidity um, and make profitable trades, right? Um, and um, or if they're more serious, maybe they're like a market maker and they're trying to place orders on chain or make markets, et cetera. So it's just one of the best benefits of Solana, in my view, of this global state machine is it makes DeFi much more enjoyable and much more interesting because you have so many different markets that can compose with each other. 
And so this is just us saying like, hey, if you want private notes to get an edge, you can kind of self-serve with Helios now. And you mentioned something interesting there regarding location, like Frankfurt versus New York. Location, does that impact speed in a couple of milliseconds being closer to where the action is or does it matter? Yep, it matters. Um, it's the same as like high frequency trading. Like the, if your servers are closer together, um, you, the distance that the, the information has to travel over the wire is less and so it can do it faster, right? Um, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's talk now about the elephant in the room because uh, <laughs> this is funny. You, you're hiring, your new assembling a new team. It looks <laughs> like people are blocking you like Ryan Shaw and Adams. David Hoffman, was that Eric yeah. and others. And, you know, I, I, I follow it all. I, I see it in, and crypto is very tribal and uh, it's okay to perhaps block people if they're being toxic or if they're scammers. But uh, there is some interesting things happening with Ethereum. We'll change gears and talk about this. We'll spend a little bit of time on L2s and Dencom because a lot of people believe that would be the silver bullet that would bring scale to Ethereum. And one of the things I do like about Vitalik, in fairness to him, he's very direct and open and honest. And I'm sure you have the same belief. But uh, he's talking a lot. Like when you read between the lines, like you can read that. And then this is kind of his prophetic words. We are not entirely out of the woods. Fees may still increase if usage grows too quickly. And we need to continue working hard to scale blobs. And then you go to this tweet from you. <laughs> this was just brilliant. Uh, blob space filling up. Uh, optimism is five transactions per second. Base fees are up 700 times. ETH is missing 13% of slots. You know, the same type of photo is thrown at Solana, by the way, for missing a certain percentage of transactions as well. And there's been five L2 outages in the past month. So your thesis there is Solana seems useful. But do you think Denkun was overhyped? And do you believe it has or has not lived up to its expectations. And what do you think of Vitalik really saying, hey, we're not going to be able to develop quick. We know we have issues. Fees are going to go up. I'm hoping to God that utility utilization doesn't go up too fast or else we're completely screwed. And, you know, if you look at the blob data here, it's <laughs> the blob base fee is through the roof. Things are completely congested by blob counts and inscriptions. It's just absolutely bonkers. So can you tell us what you think about Denkun and ETH? Is it a threat? Uh, what's going to happen over the next two years? Yeah, so w with regards to if 4844 Denkun was overhyped, it really depends on who we're talking about. I think 4844 on its own is a great upgrade. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's good on Ethereum that they were able to pull this off and reduce costs for posting data to Ethereum. I think that should be applauded. It's certainly a good accomplishment. Um, and, you know, if things stop there, obviously nobody would have any issues, right? Ethereum just has lower fees now, great, okay? But the, the problem is, of course, that's not what happens on, on Twitter, okay? What happens on Twitter is people will say, okay, Ethereum fees are now cheaper, therefore Solana is dead, or yeah. like, Therefore, Solana sucks. Or like, therefore, this will be cheaper than Solana. And I say, okay, the second you start bringing that into it, now I have to kind of, uh, you know, now my ADHD is going to kick in and be like, wait a minute, I think you're not being very honest with people who are reading this because that's not what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it, actually, if you go to the Denkun website, 4844, Vitalik himself says, when Blobs first launch, the price is going to be very, very low in the very short term. Okay. And most honest people on Ethereum actually know this, right? So John Charbonneau literally wrote on Twitter, Hey guys, the price data right now is meaningless. Do not take victory laps or Mert will take screenshots of you. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, even like Polygon, uh, one of my uh, friends from Polygon, he's a developer there, developer relations. He said the same thing. He said, don't do this, Mert's going like, to take screenshots of you. But of course, so there are definitely quite a few honest people there that already knew this. But then, you know, maybe you have some VCs or some compromised individuals that may have blocked me, let's say, uh, saying things like, oh, Solana is now dead. These fees are now much cheaper. And it's like, no, that's not how that works, okay? The blob market is a market. That is to say, the more people use it, the more expensive it gets. Basic supply and demand. 
obviously when you first switch over to it, nobody's going to be using it. And therefore the price will be super cheap. Yeah. Okay. And so I said, it's dishonest because once you get usage, it's going to be more expensive and it's going to be much more expensive than Solana. And for example, people uh, were took screenshots of swapping on base and they were like, oh, this is 0 0.003 cents. And on Solana, it's 0 0.03 cents. Base is now cheaper than Solana. Base is now one. Altus have one. Okay. Well, now if you look at it, now swapping on base can cost you anywhere from $2 to $8 and it might still fail. Okay. Meanwhile, Solana's actually gotten cheaper. Okay. Um, so, and, and everybody already knew that this would happen because that's how blobs work. And um, so that's kind of, I don't, you know, I think it's great that 4844 went live. I think it's, it should be hyped, like they should be celebrating that. But obviously, if you're going to celebrate that, but then use that as some weird hedge to dunking on Solana, that doesn't really make sense because you're just lying to people. That's yeah. the fee mechanism, uh, as you can see from the data. Like if you just go to basescan.org or something, you'll see the fees for yourself. You don't have to listen to me. Um, so that's one part. Um, and then I, I guess going back to me, Vitalik, uh, yeah, he did, he did write a post, I believe yesterday about how, um, he thinks that if you look at like the technology S curve, uh, he thinks that Ethereum has made kind of the two biggest upgrades that it will make for a very long time, yep. which was the merge and then now 4844. And now he thinks that basically Ethereum development will decelerate. And so it's going to be on the L2s to help Ethereum scale more. Um, yeah, I mean, I think given Ethereum's current scale and size, I think that's probably what they have to do. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I don't work on the protocol myself, so it wouldn't make too much sense for me to comment. Um, but I fundamentally disagree with that premise. You know, I think it's fine for them to take it. That's okay. But I think we're so early in crypto's phase of, you know, world adoption that I think we need to do the hard work of really, really working to scale the L1 directly before adding these layers on top of it. Because if you're adding these layers on top of, of sand, a quicksand of not the most stable, most scalable foundation, at some point physics is going to catch up to you and you're going to have to change some other things. Okay. Um, that's just maybe a philosophical difference. Um, so I personally don't resonate with slowing down development on the L1 currently. And I agree with that. And in fact, I came up with a statistic and I'd like to run this by you. And that is the theoretical transactions per second and time to finality and creating a ratio of one divided by the other. You divide your TPS by time to finality to get an overall ratio. The question is, for the modern world, you know, for example, running markets, DEXs, real world assets, tokenization of everything, don't you really need finality before you can run markets if you have multiple buyers coming in? So isn't that really key? Because when you, when you introduce layer twos, you lose a lot of that finality. So when I share these stats for these different chains, a little bit out of date um, in terms of the TPS, because they have varied slightly since I did this a month or two ago, but it's pretty much right there. Where, where, where do you see this as being an important metric for the future, if at all? I would say for, so maybe to, to take a more nuanced perspective, I think there are some certain things that a giant global L1 does better than L2s. And then there are some things that L2s might do better than L1s. Now, I think what where L1s really shine is things requiring composability and real-time information discovery. So for example, price, right? So I think if, you, if you're going to do global finance and DeFi, I think something like a Solana, which, you know, by the way, that is kind of the inception story of it, right? NASDAQ at, uh, or blockchain at NASDAQ speed. That is, that is the vision. And also and, what we started talking about as well, you're sniping and the importance of milliseconds by having your server close to the market. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's like, if the liquidity is in kind of a singular place and there's atomic composability, I think DeFi has a much uh, more interesting upper bound of potential than if it were, um, let's say, uh, 
hidden behind bridges or something like that, right? It would it could still work in that way, by the way. But I don't think it's the optimal case. And I think in you know if you take capitalism to its eventual, then I think the thing that's the best solution you'll find you'll you'll reach that at some point, right? It might not be ASAP, but at some point you will. Um, and and so I think for DeFi and like things requiring DeFi properties of like composability, finality, latency, etc. I think an L1 is just a no brainer there. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think everything needs the L1 though. Like for example, if you need like a niche dedicated block space game where like you're basically not interacting with the global state machine and all you care about is, you know, maybe it's some inventory for some game. I think an L2 is totally fine for that. Like if you, if you want, sure. Like I don't have anything against that. But for, for things that require, like for example, Deepin, like physical infrastructure networks, payments, and DeFi, I think the best tool for the job is a global state machine. Um, and so that is, so, you know, people always say it's like Solana versus Ethereum, and it's like, sure, they compete in, in some regards, but at some point they stop making sense to compare. It's almost like comparing an F1 car to like a Toyota, a right? It's like, yeah. yeah, like you don't necessarily drive those in the same conditions, right? Like they're different. They're sure they're cars, but they do different things. And there was another another big takeaway from this too, which fascinates me. It's the the Lindy effect. The newer chains are faster. <laughs> the older chains are slower. Um, and one of my theses is new stuff will replace old stuff. They're, the new stuff's better, cheaper, faster. Is that too crude an analogy for this world? I know Bitcoin is an outlier. Yeah, I'm just purpose. trying to think about that a bit. Um, it's certainly, I think it's hard to say what types of systems systems these will turn out to be in the long term. Certainly, there is always value in moving fast, but there's also value in predictability so or, or consistency. So I'm, I'm unclear on which one makes the perfect sense. Like, I think you just let these things play out and then see what happens in reality. But one thing I will say is the only real moat that you have as uh, as an ecosystem, let's say, is the ability to consistently listen to your users and then ship upgrades as fast as possible, right? Execution and being able to ship things to production, like every single week, day, whatever cadence you have, is the only moat, right? If you stop innovating, you're dead, right? If you, if you stop swimming, you get eaten by sharks. And so that's why actually I, I commented going back to the earlier thing, I really don't like Ethereum's roadmap of like how they're going to now decelerate working on the L1. It's like, that just doesn't excite me. I want to, I want to work on the L1 and push that to its limits and keep improving that every single day and see where we can take this thing. Right. People can still build L2s on top of it if they want. That's fine. I don't, it's a permissionless network, but I do want to see what we can do if we can just keep pushing the, the limits here of blockchain scaling directly at the most fundamental layer. Yeah, because if if we do talk about big picture, where the future is going, and Tolly as well, for years, used to say path to 1 billion users. The infra is not there to support 1 billion users. And last time we spoke, I think about four months ago, you said we are years away from that, maybe. Correct still, or has that changed? Yeah, no, I don't think we can handle a billion users today. Definitely not. I mean... No chance. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends what they're doing on chain. Like, obviously, some applications use the blockchain more than others. Like something like a Farcaster, for example, doesn't really use the blockchain that much. But something like a like meme coins, for example, are just directly on chain. And so a billion, like people actually really get confused by this number. But like Twitter does not have a billion users. And like Twitter does like, I think maybe like 2000 or 4000 TPS or like rights yep. per second. And Twitter is used by everybody all the time. And um, so people do overestimate how much demand there will be, given that we haven't you know, really seen that many applications that need this block space. Um, that is not to say we, we shouldn't build for that, but you know, I think there needs to be some, at some point you need to think like, wait a minute, where is this billion TPS gonna come from if nobody is using like half of these chains that are launched today? Like they have one, two TPS, why is that? It's because there's no demand for it, okay? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents. Good. Let's go to back to FUD fighting because that's the theme today, not this one. This one. Uh, Vibu 
Drip spent $18,000 in fees on Solana in the last six days. And of course, you counterfeited it. <laughs> counteracted it with a correction of uh, kind of NFTs at scale and the real truth. But because of that, um, you know, we showed the blocking thing, but you're getting shade from a lot of people. We're talking about kind of alt L1s, etc. cetera. You, you, you may have seen this, you may have ignored it. Uh, but uh, how, you know, uh, how do you deal with this? Because again, it goes back to the bigger picture of crypto being so cultish, people defending their bags, their positions, etc. And then sometimes they get really heated and they say mm -hmm. awful things. Um, what, what do you say to this? Do you just ignore the noise and let product market fit take care of the rest or what? Well, I do think it, 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 it's somewhat nuanced. I, I do think that if you have information that you think is useful, you should say it, right? I think there's like a trope or like a cheesy saying is like for like bad to happen, you just need good men to do nothing in a sense, right? Something like that. Yes. Now, I don't think I'm good. I don't think I'm bad either. I just think I believe some things to be true. And if I believe that, then it's in my best interest to speak that out loud. If people disagree, they disagree. Maybe I learned something and update my point of view, uh, or maybe other people, right? That's, that's kind of how society works. You, you, you have, you study something, you educate yourself, you cast your opinions, and then you debate, you discuss, and then you get slightly closer to the truth of, of the matter. Okay. That's how society is supposed to function in my view. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of like lies because there's financials involved and people start lying. And that's generally why I tweet now too, is like, and I tweet, by the way, if you've noticed, I tweet specifically with screenshots because I don't want people to believe me. I want people to believe the evidence. Like the screenshot is there. You did say this. That's why I'm screenshotting it. Not so I can like get likes, which although that does help, but it's so that you, people can irref irrefutably see that that is what you said. Um, this person, uh, I think they're replying to one of my posts about, um, how people keep launching L2s to make money instead of actually solve problems, right? If you actually, it ties into nicely to what we were just talking about. People keep launching new chains, but these new chains keep getting one TPS or two TPS. And the reason is because there's no demand. And the reason there's no demand is because they're not solving any problems that exist, right? People don't have to incentivize me with an airdrop so that I can drink water, right? I drink water because I need to drink water. I don't need to get paid for this. Uh, if you need to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to use your app, I probably don't really need it. Now, it might be an interesting marketing technique if you actually have a good product and you want to get more eyes on it, but that's generally not the case. And so when that person says, um, you know, or when they're criticizing what I'm saying, my thesis is that, so for example, you see that base is now making like $2 million per day yep. and Ethereum is only making about $10,000 worth of that. Right. So it's actually leaking a lot of value to the L2. And then, by the way, base is going to launch L3s on top of it. So even less of that value is going to accrue back to Ethereum. And so then I'm saying, like, OK, people will use the fact that this L2 is making millions of dollars to launch their own L2s. Right. That's how incentives work. But if that's how you're thinking, you've already kind of lost the plot because you're just launching the L2 to make money as opposed to saying, like, wait a minute, there's a problem here. I want to solve this problem. And I will solve it with an L2 because that best fits the solution or the problem, right? Like, for example, if you, you look at Henry Ford or something, he doesn't just think, hmm, these horses suck. If only I could build something that would make me money. He's like, no, no, no. How do I like improve transportation for humans, right? What, what, what is the problem that I need to solve here? Um, and I think in crypto, we just do not do that, right? The financial incentives are so like extreme, like you get instant liquidity and a lot of it and the prices change up and down so much that people who actually should be focusing much more on the user and the problems tend to not do that. And that's kind of my criticism. Yeah, it's funny. I had to dig up this little quote. I think it's very profound as well right now. You have enemies. Good. That means you stood up for something sometime in your life from Winston Churchill. Sometimes these little things. <laughs> and, and I've been uh, trolling around the world. I have another uh, interesting one somewhere if i can find it which goes back to uh what we were saying about maybe here yes 
you. Um, how can you tell your team you're building for the long term and believe the company and simultaneously be cashing out so you can buy a mansion? We see a lot of secondary sales, insider sales on crypto. I saw something last week which I found very disturbing, a top project basically saying, hey, you know, I get this all the time and I've never once taken a paid promotion, never will. I don't need to, I'm fortunate. But there are chains that know they are not going to make it, but they also know their time is running out. So now is the time to cash in their chips. And it's mm -hmm. desperate that I can't share this or show the world, but um, we, maybe you can tell the world what to be aware of out there. Like, Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, this particular tweet, um, it kind of just goes back to what I was just saying, yeah. which is that people just have in, in, in crypto, um, or maybe to frame the conversation for the listener, uh, if you think about the web two world, like normal technology, like a, like a Google or Facebook, uh, these people, what they do is they see a problem, they want to solve it, but then their incentives, right? So for example, their equity is locked up over four years, five years, six years, whatever and they have skin in the game and they have equity and there are no shortcuts right you will probably fail in crypto uh, in the startups Crypt startups are super hard um in crypto even if you are totally building something useless that sucks that is not helping anybody you will you can still very reasonably get and probably you will get a very large payout just because of the perverse incentive systems of the of the uh industry right uh you can just lodge some funny uh picture and then tweet the ticker and then maybe you own some portion of the supply and then you get people to buy and you just dump on their head <laughs> like that's it you are now you have now made more money than you would have if you had built something useful for other humans right so the incentives and then so i've tweeted about this a few times the incentives are such that and by the way vcs encourage this right like some not all vcs but some vcs who are, aren't really VCs, they're really just glorified swing traders, uh, will, will, will say like, will tell their core codes, hey, you should launch a token now, or like, hey, you should uh, uh, pivot to being an L2, launch your own L2, launch your own chain. It's like, dude, what is that solving? Like that is solving maybe your balance sheet, but you're not solving any problem here. Um, and so then the I tweeted something like this, and, and, and my point is like, given that this is the case right given that startups are super difficult and given that the incentives are so like short term and, and extreme you need people who are basically insane to build mission driven startups for the long term right people who are just like religiously like believers in the mission right like a like a vitalik like an anatoly yes. okay those people do not care how much money they make like they don't right totally could be on a beach somewhere right now and not doing anything he's not doing that Okay, he has more than enough money, believe me, uh, because because there's, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, you, we're all here or not all here, but some of us here are, are, are here to build systems that will actually improve the shortcomings of the existing systems. Right. That is why I'm here, at least to leave a legacy. Uh, that is not to say, yeah, yeah like that's not to say you shouldn't want to make money. Everybody wants to make money. That's just being a human. Okay, that's totally fine that, you know, make make money, try to make it. If somebody's gonna make it, it might as well be you, right? But my thing is like, that can't be the only thing if you're a builder, right? Like if you're a user, it's fine. But if you're a builder, that can't be your only motivation because otherwise you're not serving your users. Hmm. Okay, so we talked a bit. One last thing on um, L2 sunk cost. This is from the fifth wave. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't really show up very correctly. Maybe it's not cropping right here. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Hang on a second. Uh, anyway, I'll read it. It took an hour last night to transfer my Matic from my ledger to the exchange. I was getting this blob space thing. The only position, very small, not in alignment, was kind of sunk cost fallacy in case in point. What a poop show. Uh, that was regarding kind of L2 experience. Um, and Matic has been around a long time and people are still having challenges moving stuff around. And I always go back to, again, Occam's Razor. L2s don't solve the problem. They add another layer of complexity. They may have slightly less fees, but at long term, it's not a big issue. Now, 
talking about the mothership from your buddy, Ryan Sean Adams, he came, <laughs> he came out and said, Coinbase is moving its business on chain. We see that from base. By the way, I think every person in the world wants to buy base. It isn't a token. You can't buy it, so don't buy a fake one. But he says, eventually, all crypto exchanges will move on chain. Yeah, that's the original totally vision. Then banks. Then every asset is a future uh, token, and every bank is a future chain. And Ethereum is the world's settlement layer. So <laughs> tell me, uh, you know, BlackRock are doing RWA on ETH, $100 million down. It's just kind of putting their toe in the water, not even putting their hair on their toe in the water, considering how big BlackRock is. But what do you think about real world assets, tokenization? A lot of people are kind of upset that Solana's not in that game right now. Is it too early or is that going to all happen big bang two years from now, like what we saw happen with USDC and stable coins and Solana? Yeah, I think a few comments here. I think, well, one, I, I do find it interesting that a show called Bankless is praising banks for uh, <laughs> using their chain. Um, but that's a separate topic. Um, I, I mean, in, in general, I think it's great that institutions are putting more assets on chain. That is what we want, right? Uh, stop using your system, use this better system, and we can all be better off as a result. So I think at a, at a high level, that's a good thing. I, I do like that. Um, I think each case is kind of different. Um, like if I were BlackRock, obviously I'm also going to use Ethereum, right? Like if, if you just think about this for a second, let's say you're this person responsible, like the director responsible for making this decision, you would have to fight an insanely uphill battle to justify putting this on Solana currently, right? Yeah. With Ethereum, you can just say, oh, well, it's been around like, 10 years, whatever, it already has more TBL. Um, it doesn't upgrade much, right? Like it's kind of more, it's kind of, uh, uh, it does so we're maybe slightly less risky. Uh, it, there's slightly less risk involved. So let's just use this, right? That's a totally fine thing. And by the way, Visa did this at first, MasterCard did this at first, PayPal did this at first. And then they all came to Solana after as well, by the way. Yeah, so that's exactly. Just because something didn't come to Solana first does not mean it will never come to Solana. We've kind of seen this many times. Uh, but I can totally see BlackRock's decision, their justification for this. Um, I think it makes sense. Um, the, the base thing is interesting, right? Like, because they're not really moving on chain, right? Like Coinbase does own the chain. They're basically just making sure that you can also see their database. That's kind of what, like, if, for example, if a hack happened on base that involves Coinbase funds, Coinbase is going to stop that. Okay, so it's, it says they're on chain, but I kind of question what that means. We saw this with Blast the other day, right? Some North Korean uh, was was hacking the chain and then Blast was ready to roll back the chain to get that back. Okay, you can now imagine what Coinbase would have done, right? Uh, the exact same thing, which is, um, so like while I do think it's good to put assets on chain and tokenize them and, and all this stuff, and I think BlackRock made a good decision. I don't care what chain they use. All I care is that they use crypto. Um, but I do think the base thing is slightly different because it's technically not like if Black or if, if Coinbase stored all their assets on ETHL one, I would applaud that much more than their own database, which is the L two. Um, and but again, like what, what I do want to say is like Solana is just a riskier choice. If you're just you know nobody got fired for buying IBM, right? That's kind of the same from back in the day. Um, it's because it's just an older, more established name. It just totally makes sense for some of these legacy institutions. Um, but if you, for example, Helium was on their own blockchain and instead of moving to an L2, they moved to Solana because at the end of the day, the physics of Solana, the tech is what enables certain use cases better than others. And so if we do our jobs correctly, those institutions will slowly start building on Solana. Yes. In fact, I'm trying to share something. I think I just screwed up. Uh, da, 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 da. Where'd you go? Me and you. And I tried to... Yeah, let me fix this. But this is another one here. Oh, there we are. Uh, another one of your infamous tweets. But uh, I call it triple down sectors. Things that Solana does really well and needs to do a lot more of for that atomic state machine. This DeFi, which is completely blowing up, smothering everything else. Payments. I think payments is the top use case for crypto on Earth. 
and uh, there's so much disruption that is ripe for the taking right now. And Deepin, and we've seen the success of that with, what, five, seven use cases so far, and there's a lot more to do. Um, anything to add mm -hmm. on this one? No, I mean, uh, I, I think, like I said earlier, uh, certain use cases benefit more from the structure of the solution than others. For a global state machine, I think DeFi and global finance make a lot of sense because the latency, the composability, same with payments, right? I've worked in digital payments my whole life. I think it's much better for the developer and the user if you don't have to worry about all these different islands, like these bridges, which because that's actually how the payment system already works today. Like if I send somebody uh, money in Australia, it actually goes through all these middle jurisdictions the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I don't want crypto to be the same thing as that where I'm just bridging through these things. I want everything to be on the same machine to begin with. Okay. And then deep in this one is obviously a bit more out there, but like um, Hive Mapper, right? Uh, taking on Google Maps. By the way, Hive Mapper is a really interesting example because they tried to build their product without crypto first and adding crypto actually really helped their business. So like Hive Mapper is like a rare case of a company who literally could not build their business without crypto. And there's actually surprisingly little of those. So Deepin is this really interesting um, new sector. And obviously Helium is the world leader. They pioneer the category. They're on Solana. High Mapper's on Solana. Render's on Solana. Teleport. Um, IONet. And there's a bunch of different ones coming soon as well. Um, and so I think... The, and then Raj commented on this saying like he agrees with the three, but he thinks that um, more use cases might benefit more from composability as we kind of uh, go go through time and, you know, totally, right? Like, for example, DeFi apps could integrate with NFTs to do some, you know, uh, collaborations. Uh, payments could work with, you know, games, such like in-game in payment systems, et cetera. There's a lot of, that is kind of the the power, uh, the superpower of a, of a global state machine is that you get composability built in instead of having to build these other abstractions on top of it that take years and, you know, uh, you may never really get there you just never even need that piece for solana yeah yet yet another opportunity now speaking of another so-called elephant in the room and i don't know why it's not exactly working properly but slightly cut off but this is the what they call the blue ocean opportunity this is put together i think by van Eck, if i'm not mistaken uh, or Masari, one or the other but Fire Dancer, you're you're closer to what's happening on the ground than probably anybody else, and and the throughput is shown here from today. What would happen with Solana Fire Dancer? How real is it? Lots of rumors that it's going to be launched in Singapore in November at the Breakpoint event, or very close to that. And I know there's a beta version up and running. Uh, can you tell us how close we are? And second of all, or whatever you can disclose. And second of all. What a game changer it will be from the hardware to the infra to the decentralization, etc. Yeah, okay. Um, so one thing I'll say is I wouldn't take this graph seriously. Um, this is kind of arbitrary and assume some assumptions that might not be true. So I personally wouldn't. I think you can like reasonably use the heuristic that Solana will have more throughput overall. But like the scale side difference here, I don't think makes sense. I don't think that's really it's fair a, to It's a 10x teams. because the team last November did say uh, the, oh, I can't recall the name who's building Fire Dancer. Uh, jump. They, yeah, Jump, Jump Crypto. They said it would be a 10x in throughput. That's probably where that 125 to 1250 came from. But you're skeptical yeah. on that. Well, this shows uh, data availability. So I, I don't even think they would agree with this. I think some but, uh, other VC firm made a chart, which is what this chart was derived off of. And like that VC firm made like an error, I think. Uh, mm. So I, I personally wouldn't use this chart, but maybe going back to Gone. the <laughs> higher point, what is, what, what is Fire Dynasty going to do? Um, well, I, I wouldn't expect a Singapore launch. Um, I would probably expect maybe a New Year launch. Um, something in that range uh, because engineering, like as you put more systems together, you find out more integration issues. And I think it's much better to be um, uh, under promise over deliver here. So I think like uh, probably new year, it seems more reasonable than breakpoints. Um, what, what will it do? Well, 
you know, I think fundamentally, for example, uh, you see the congestion problems on chain today, fire answer optim optimizations that since they build it from the ground up, that would have already fixed that. So we wouldn't even have seen it. Right. So that's already a pretty good improvement, right? It's a totally new system that already has a lot of improvements that the system doesn't have. Um, it, it makes better use of hardware than the current system, right? So that is to say you can get more juice out of the same hardware and you can think about this in two ways. One is maybe you can run Solana with lower machines now, with cheaper machines, or you can actually put even more juice on and really push the limits, right? Since now you're uh, uh, making full use of the machine. And that probably will come to social consensus. Like some validators will say, okay, let's do that. Some will say, let's not. That should be fun. It's, it's hard to predict that. Can we, can we double um, click into the hardware piece for a second? Two things, uh, a common complaint against Solana and being a validator is you need to have a lot of money to invest in both machines and storage. And then the second point, uh, a fire dancer is supposed to run a very generic old like Dell, Intel type boxes. And then third point is Tolly said last week or the week before that the validators made enough money in one day to build another thousand, to support the hardware for another thousand validators or words to that effect. I could be slightly off going from memory here. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. How does that all feed in? Uh, it'll mean it'll be easier for validators to spin up a node and get running and maintain, which will help the chain. So the, my, my theory on this is, and I think Vitalik has the same theory, uh, in his blog post called Endgame. And basically it, it is that block producers, so like machines that produce the blocks on the blockchain, that will be like a specialized business in my view going forward, because it's very hard and you need people that really know what they're doing to do that. Uh, and, and you want that to be high performance as possible. So I think it's totally fine that those machines are like large machines, like very strong hardware requirements. What you really want though is people to be able to verify what's happening on the blockchain without trusting anybody, right? That's kind of the point of crypto. And so put, put differently, you want very, very high hardware requirement block production, but you want very, very light verification. And for this is actually what ZK helps with, by the way, zero knowledge proofs. They give you a validity proof. You can check the proof. Boom. That's it. And by the way, Solana can add that. That is not exclusive to Ethereum. Um, and so my argument here is we should actually try to push the hardware requirements up so that we can really separate ourselves and start doing much more throughput, more blocks, bigger blocks, et cetera. And then also focus on verification of these blocks so that anybody can just verify that something was valid on the blockchain on their computer. Okay. And that's what's going to happen with Ethereum in the end game as well. So we might as well do that currently with Solana because we can. That's how I kind of think about it. I think the hardware stuff is generally super overblown. Uh, like somebody will say, well, like if I, I can't run it on my you know smart fridge, then it's not a blockchain. It's like, no, that's not how that works <laughs> at all. Um, like you just need to be able to verify what happened on an accessible device that I agree with this, but you don't need to prove the block on a smart fridge. Otherwise, how are you going to scale? Like, how, mm. like that's just not possible. Okay. And by the way, hardware improves over time. Like this is something that we know. More right? more. People just, yep. yeah. Something people just seem to forget this in crypto that oh like hardware doesn't improve. It's like no no no. You look at your phone, you look at your laptop, you look at your computer, your car, anything, your internet. It has always improved over time. If 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 that didn't happen, humanity is going to have much bigger problems than shit coins. Okay, like the, uh, humanity for for them to survive and scale, we need hard like AI for example relies exclusively on hardware in a sense, right? AR VR as well, right? Hardware is extremely important. Energy, like Tesla, for example, basically a hardware business. So, yeah. And hardware is hard. Remember that, everybody. And it's funny because you talk about Moore's Law. If you look at the half-life of an ASICs rig that mines Bitcoin, it's 18 months. They're obsolete in three years, which I think is an interesting analog. Okay. A um, couple more little points I want to touch on. New dApps that are coming. There's some very interesting stuff coming like Parcel for Real Estate, Camino Finance, Zeus, mm -hmm. uh, getting a lot of buzz, kind of a, a layer two sort of, you know, integrating 
the base layer as Bitcoin with Solana sitting on top, things that have been discussed for a long time. How, how real is Zeus, first of all? Because it sounds really interesting, but apparently it's only 40% cooked. Have you dug into that? I, I'm actually not too familiar. I know I've heard the project seems cool, but I haven't done the work to have an opinion. Okay. And then Jupiter is smoking it and doing really well. Any projects that you are involved in or thinking about or just building your own stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I really like... Um, so, I mean, first, I think, like, one interesting thing to watch for is all these DeFi teams launching their tokens, hmm. right? So, like, Camino, Margin, uh, Drift, uh, Parcel, Wormhole, right? So, there's going to be some interesting uh, activity on chain happening soon. Um, and that, I mean, that, that's probably going to be... Oh, and then actually, there's a hackathon right now called Coliseum on Solana, where, and by the way, like, most solid teams that you see today on Solana are actually the winners of past hackathons. Yes. So there's going to be, um, and this might be the biggest hackathon so far. I'm not sure. Uh, it certainly seemed like it. And so there's, there's a lot of people who are like building interesting things that haven't announced what they're building yet. And we'll see those in the next you know, week or two. And that's going to be a very interesting time. Um, because we're actually running it like a, like a, like an accelerator program on Solana now where the winners, we actually incubate them and mentor them and then give them resources so they can build better businesses on top of the chain. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I've seen like a Solana email service, for example, that could be interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk of MEV, um, liquid staking. So there's a lot of things happening. Yeah, well, one of the things that was an interesting research post that came out from CoinGecko a week ago, and it talked about kind of, I don't know if this is the right term, but I consider it mindshare. But Solana as a chain has 50% of the mindshare. Ethereum has about 14% and the rest has the rest. So when you think about mindshare, that also has an impact on market share, which has an impact on what gets the attention and the liquidity and where the money flows. So there's a two-part question. One, it's clear a lot of the money is flowing into the Solana ecosystem. I've referred to it as a black hole for a year and a half now. And all the adoption, all the users, all the NFT action, all the DEX action, all the stablecoin action, it's all happening on Solana. But now with Solana issuing so many tokens, you know, there's only so many dollars to go around. Could that cause a lid to be placed on the upside for many of these tokens. Again, it just came into my head talking to you here. Like, for example, you've got people that are heavily invested in Solana and a new token comes out. They sell some of their Solana to buy some of the new token. Then another new token comes out. They sell some of that token that they speculated on to buy the new one. The money just rotates around. How do you see that impacting the space? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the short term, that this is kind of what I mean by there needs to be some value created and some real problems being solved. Because if all you're doing is rotating money around, then that's just like a weird game of uh, musical chairs. Okay, people are just dumping on each other. And then whoever, you know, pulls out last makes the least money like it's, it's just I mean, that's fine. You know, that's if you want to play that game, go ahead. You know, I have nothing against that. But at some point, there needs to be some real value created. And you need to get more people inside the ecosystem. Uh, and the way you're going to do that is by solving problems and making things uh, interesting for them. For example, I believe like the 2021 bull, bull run really started because of like NBA Top Shot. Because that was just like a fun game. People actually played. Um, I played it, right? Uh, and it's on Flow, right? I don't even know what Flow is. It's kind of like this Canadian blockchain. Um, and I think this meme coins are kind of what that was uh, to that cycle, to this cycle. Um, but, you know, at some point, it's, it's, and by the way, I think Tolly would have the answer that, like, I don't care if that happens. All I care about is that the apps building on Solana are successful and make more money than Solana. That would be his answer. And obviously, yeah. that would be um, my answer as well, ultimately. But currently speaking, um, for like the Solana asset itself to, let's say, go up in price, you just need to build cool things that attract, like you said, attention and, and ideally attract people who want to solve certain problems, 
right? Like, ideally, I want to use Solana because it's the best place I can send my dad money, okay? That means I have to use it. I have no choice. It's what I need to solve my problem. And then that's like a good sticky user. Um, and so it's hard to say like um, exactly how those token launches will go. I think, for example, if you look at the Jito airdrop um, from a few months ago, if you look at the charts before and after that, that event actually catalyzed a huge increase in Solana prices, right? Because it does bring more attention and it results in other use cases that also bring attention. So there's a nonlinear effect that nobody can really predict. Um, I think the best we can do really is just um, try to build things that help people. Um, and, and you know, like the, the tokens, like I think it's totally fine to, you know, there's, you get an airdrop, maybe you believe in the company, so you hold some or maybe you sell some, whatever. That's just markets doing their thing. Um, but I think if your thesis is for the system is longer than, you know, a few years, then ultimately it's all a positive. And if you're already holding for the long term, then this should just be, uh, a fun little event on you know on the way to the top in a sense. Exactly. What I have noticed as well, and I remember uh, that was the plan a couple of years ago for all new projects on Solana that have much better, much fairer tokenomics. Have you witnessed the same thing as well? There's no longer ninety percent for the insiders and ten percent for the investors or the retail. Um, yeah, the um, the Alameda special. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, most of those VCs are wiped out. Uh, so that's good. Uh, I'm not sure if they're all wiped out. Uh, I'm not necessarily a big, um, you know, there's a lot of people who do like on-chain analysis of like token distribution and stuff. I generally, um, you know, obviously I call out the big ones that I, I noticed, but I don't notice all of them. There's a lot of other people who do though. And I think it does seem better. So for example, Gito's launch was super fair. Um, I think Pith's launch was super fair as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can see these launches before, time and you can see their allocation and distribution and if you don't like how that thing is distributed you know maybe talk about it make your point say i disagree with this don't buy it buy it right i think the information uh, the important thing is that there is no information asymmetry like you don't know that there's actually a hidden person who has information you don't that's just going to dump on you i think that's unethical but as long as the information is symmetrical such that everybody has the same information then you can make whatever decision you want with your own uh, uh, criteria. Yeah, this has been fantastic. I'm looking at the people in the chat live. They love you. They love all you are sharing. Very last question. We're going to end on a spicy note. So uh, you did mention in a tweet, uh, you said, I'll start the two biggest da -da -da bleep bleep grabs in crypto. So I, I, I am a, I'm a data-driven investor. I look at data. Uh, every single way to Sunday. And there's two you did mention. One was ICP and the other one was uh, Cardano. And when you look at how they stack up to Solana, it's quite embarrassing. Some of the metrics here are tens of thousands of percent better, which is kind of stunning all across the board. Uh, these Some of these chains don't have proper dApps that run. Some of them are driven by... Who knows what, but the people behind, behind them can be, I don't know, they don't have the same type of culture or attitude that other people would in the crypto space be. But I'd like your thoughts on what you think about some of these other chains and is it a bad thing for the space? Why do people still hold these assets when it's pretty clear they're not going to make it? Uh, but if you tell the holders of those tokens that they're assets, you're trying to help them, that they're not going to make it, they get really upset. <laughs> it's like a, <laughs> there was an Elon Musk picture of flicking a tiger. Um, it's like one of those things you just, you just don't want to do. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what, what can you say to the, the listeners here that may have some of these yeah. things? Yeah, I mean, look... Fundamentally, I'm a nerd, okay? I, I, I'm a nerd. I like building things. I like technology. And I'm in the space to solve problems and improve the existing system. That's, I don't, if I wanted to make money, I could just launch a shitcoin, dump it, whatever. That's, I don't, I don't care about this. Um, I think if uh, these other chains 
t- the, the reason I, I call them, let's say, derogatory terms is, is twofold. Um, one is that um, they've been around for some time now, like quite many years, and they haven't actually done anything, right? Like they will say they're doing something and they will point to some upcoming upgrade. It's like, okay, I understand that you've made changes, but what have you actually achieved? And they will say something like, I don't know, we achieved some theoretical thing in testnet or somebody wrote a paper. It's like, okay, but what problem have you solved? Who is coming on your chain right now to solve a problem, right? Um, who is helping the creator economy on your chain? Okay, who is trading things at a cheaper uh, uh, margin than, than TradFi? Okay, who is helping uh, global mobile networks like Helium on your chain, right? Like, or is it such that you have bought early and now you're trying to convince other people to buy and then those people convince other people to buy and then you guys are just telling this, yourselves the same story. Meanwhile, nothing actually gets built, okay? Because that is a Ponzi, that, that is a scam. <laughs> you do not want to do that. And if you do want to do that, you know what? Go ahead, whatever. But at least don't then say things like, oh, well, your chain sucks, et cetera. It's like, okay, let's look at our own houses before we go to the other houses, okay? Yeah. Like, for example, the, the reason, it's not like I just woke up one day and I was like, these chains suck. It's like, it's because one day I woke up and these chains are saying things like, oh, well, Solana uh, can't do this load. They're fake. They're scams. It's like, what? It's like, where are you getting this information from? Like, can you guys maybe look at solving your own problems before trying to hate on other chains? So they poke right? the tiger first. <laughs> like, uh, the tiger. especially on Reddit, right? These people just like, oh yeah, I don't know. They have this weird cult on Reddit where they just lie to each other and it's a viper's it's just nest. The blind and the blind. Yeah. And like, what makes me angry is like, I don't know. I'll get like my brother or something, and he'll like message me like, "Hey, what is what is this Ada thing? Should I buy this?" And I'm like, "Holy shit, man!" Like the, you're like, do not buy this absolute thing that just does not stand for anything except for listening to one guy who tells them what is right and wrong, right? And by the way, if you guys disagree with this, that's fine. Just prove me wrong, right? Like, I'm not I'm not anybody special. If you think I'm wrong, okay. First of all, short Solana, buy your coin, wait five years, see what happens, build something, prove me wrong, right? I'm just, this is just an opinion. You don't have to agree with it. Um, but if you are going to say something like Solana is a scam and my chain X is better, make sure you have the data to prove those claims. Cause if you don't, then I will disprove you, uh, assuming the data is on my side. Okay. Like, so that's, that's kind of my whole two cents on it. I love that. And I, um, very grateful the time we've gone over an hour. That was the FUD fighter show. <laughs> with us i thought i thought that was a, a cool name i said to my graphics person i need the term foot fighters but in the font of the foo fighters <laughs> so we had to modify it slightly so there's no trademark infringement because that's their own custom font anyway um any final thoughts regarding this over hour-long session and people got so much from it they're very very happy with you shedding light on what is right and that's so important in today's world especially in 2024 when i used to say that 98 percent of crypto is a scam now it's 99.5 percent of crypto is a scam <laughs> so be careful out there everybody make sure whatever you do it's something legitimate or else your money will disappear really fast it's the wild west and more any final third thoughts kind sir before i let you kick off into the weekend by the way you you're east coast canada correct ish yeah, yeah, correct. Oh, so it's, late, um, it's late for you after four o'clock. I don't, I don't really, I, I, okay. I have no life. Um, <laughs> and um, final words, I guess, would be, um, you know, if there's one thing to take away, I, I would just say, like, you know, try to obtain uh, useful sources of information as opposed to something like a Reddit or something. Try to like actually read the source yourself, and then think about it critically, and then make your own opinions. Right? Don't listen to me. Don't listen to anybody else. Just think deeply about what you're consuming. Think if it makes sense, put your thoughts out there and then be open to like, maybe you there's a disagreement and maybe you learn or maybe you help somebody else, right? Just do honest inquiry, write, read. And I think if everybody did that a bit more, we'd be better off. Excellent. Oh, it was one thing I did forget to mention. You have a new fund. You said you would commit to funding somebody with a great idea or words to that effect. You're also hiring. Any uh, quick comments on that for the team here? 
because I know it's a very small world. Yeah. A lot of people want to get into crypto, crypto development. They may have a brilliant idea. They just need help getting it off the ground. How can yeah. you guide yeah. them? Uh, so one, I am hiring for engineers and researchers at Helios. So if that interests you, just shoot me a DM on Twitter. And then two, yeah, I do have a fund. I invest, I angel invest. I can lead pre-seed or seed rounds as well. So if you have a cool idea that solves a real problem and um, you know, you're like an insane founder that's super mission driven, send me your deck, right? Send me a, a pitch deck or uh, your idea, uh, written material. I'll take a look and then we can go from there. Awesome. Appreciate you, sir. Happy Easter. Happy weekend. Happy Friday. Thank you, everybody, Thank you. as well. Thank you to the mods in the chat. And we have nearly 3,500 people watching live. And they stuck till the bitter end <laughs> over an hour with us. So I'll see you all soon once again. Big round of applause to Mert for doing such a brilliant job. And follow him on Twitter. Check out Helios Labs and all the other great stuff he does. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.